if you don't get it, you're watching here the winds of history, you know, from a very, very close perspective. Um, sometimes you can't perceive that history is being made, right? It, it usually takes perspective, it takes years, and they say, oh, that was historic. But when you're talking about events like this, with people sitting around this table and just listening to that extraordinary kaleidoscope of 11 new leaders and how this changes everything, right? We are in the process of changing the world now as a group. You're doing it here. And, you know, we say in uh, Hebrew, kolakavod, or in Arabic, mabruk, to Bob and to Dov, okay, who without this wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't happen, really. Uh, so I'm a, an entrepreneur. I'm a startup guy. I, with this English, I was born in the States. I moved to Israel uh, over 40 years ago as a young person and uh, built several companies. My first company, I raised money here, believe it or not, before there was a single venture capital fund. Okay, if you can imagine an Israel without venture capital, well, that's the Israel where I started my first company. And uh, did that successfully, took them public or sold them in fiber optics and internet software, was one of the first venture capitalists uh, in Israel, built a fund called Israel Seed Partners, managed that, then went off and actually, I think, created TikTok about, about 15 years too early. Uh, still got it public. It was a company called Vringo. And uh, about 10 years ago, I was fortunate enough to get together with some friends and start something called R Crowd, which today is Israel's most active venture capital investor, but is pioneering democratic access to venture capital. And we employ about 250 people and I see probably about 50 that I'd like to hire right now. So by all means, get my card and stay in touch with me because we are you know, powered by people like yourself. Now, I get credit for some of this, but you guys do the work and, and, and learn a great deal. I wanna share with you my sort of perspective on the Accords from a perspective of a venture capitalist and a entrepreneur uh, and then talk about you know, the, the, the greater importance, and then hopefully have some kind of, if we have time, Bob, dialogue with some questions and answers. Um, but I wanna start with setting the context in terms of Israel's uh, tech ecosystem. And it turns out that, you know, venture capital in Israel has just been on a tear. Uh, you don't have to be a smart statistician to know that this is significant, right? If you look over the last decade and you see that the amount of capital being invested in Israel uh, in venture-backed startups has grown from billion and a half, two billion, to $25 billion last year. That dwarfs all of the charity US aid by literally multiples. This is the beating heart of the Israeli economy. And it's what gives us our name as the startup nation. Now, more important than investment, of course, is taking money off the table. It's relatively easy to make an investment. Not so easy to actually make money doing this, but uh, last year there was 80 billion, you know, realized in exits, which is a pretty good ratio to the 25 billion invested. Uh, and now we're getting recognition from places that we never used to get. I mean, when I would give a talk 10 or 20 years ago about the emerging tech ecosystem here, I'd have to go to the you know, uh, Israeli finance ministry or the foreign affairs and get some, quote, propaganda slides, and they weren't so great. Now I just let the WEF, that is not the WTF, it's the WEF, the world, that's the laugh line, your students, you're supposed to laugh at that. Okay, anyway, uh, a little off color. Uh, it's the World Economic Forum okay, which are the guys who put on the Davos conference. And what they do is they rank countries in terms of innovation. And Israel is ranked number one in terms of, uh, you know, growth of innovative companies. One that always surprises me is uh, 
macroeconomic stability. I mean, I think that award should probably go to the Iron Dome. But uh, th then, you know, you look at R&D spending, you look at uh, attitudes towards entrepreneurial risk. It's quite amazing to get that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of recognition. When you look at the tech ecosystem in Israel, at the heart of it are the thousands of entrepreneurs, many of them who come from the IDF units, who meet along the way thousands of angel investors and uh, incubators and accelerators, the venture capitalists, and then the 400 or so multinationals, and you get this stirring of the pot where there now are 400,000 people working in the tech sector in Israel of which 40,000 of them are already stock option millionaires. You should know, speaking about economic freedom, which is a remarkable creation of wealth, which is going on here because of this engine of economic growth. Now, you guys know what unicorns are, right? These are companies that are uh, essentially worth a billion dollars but aren't yet public, they're not publicly traded. And in the world as a whole, there are about a 1,000 unicorns total. Israel's number, by the way, this is a little bit old data, is now approaching 100. I think we're at 97 or 98, which means that Israel has a healthy 10% of the world's unicorns, which is exactly correlated to our percentage of the world population. <laughs> that, you laughed. OK, thank you. OK. I mean, the reality you know is that our population is one-tenth of one percent. We shouldn't even by rights have one unicorn in this country, except we've got a hundred. Now, it turns out that unicorns don't light up anybody's fires anymore. What you're really looking for are the decahorns, the, you know, the $10 billion companies, or even companies like Mobileye, which is a leader in terms of collision avoidance. Uh, that was bought by Intel for 16 billion, part of Intel's 50 billion dollar investment program in Israel, which now is talking about going out public at a 50 billion. Our challenge is not just to grow more startups and more unicorns, but how do we grow companies that are 50 billion, 100 billion, and the answer is we can't do it alone. We only do it in partnership with our friends in the Abraham Accords, where we start up here and scale up together. Okay, this is really, you know, to sort of, you know, give you a little bit of a sneak preview of what I want to say about the Abraham Accords, this is part of my belief of what's going to happen. Now, around the world, people are fighting for these unicorns to come and set up shop, because when a unicorn comes to town, jobs follow, investment profits follow, all kinds of good stuff. So right now in the States, California and New York are duking it out mano a mano, and they're competing to you know, get the most Israeli unicorns. But it's not just the US. Turns out that Europe is dramatically increasing its investment in Israel, as is Japan. Who is decreasing? China. Actually, the Chinese dollars coming into this country have dropped by over 50%. And that's due to issues they have getting money out of China as well as sort of US pressure to sort of ease up and both are having an impact. Turns out that there's a huge romance going on with India. Okay, this bromance with the former uh, Is Israeli prime minister and uh, uh, the current you know, Indian prime minister is reflective of a very deep and strong tie between these two countries. Singapore is another one that's increasing. But the real show is the Abraham Accords, okay? And that's without question, yes, that deserves applause. That's an applause line. Uh, and there were some people who didn't get it two years ago. There were some people who did get it, like my friend Sabah al-Banali. Because uh, I don't know if you've met him yet here at this conference or whatnot, but I'll tell you, a story about how I met Sabah, which is that the Accords happened, I think it was about two or three weeks after the signing. I get a call from a mutual friend, someone who went to school with Sabah, where he did his PhD at, uh, he was with you at Princeton or with you at, okay, undergraduate at Princeton, he did his PhD at Columbia. And 
I knew him because his father was close to one of my first investors, and he's a really great guy in New York who's a very successful entrepreneur. And he calls me out of the blue, and he says, look, I got really something sort of strange. I don't know what to do with it. But I got a friend who lives in the UAE named Sabah al-Banali, and he is so hyped up on this new Abraham Accords that he wants to come live in Israel for a while and start working on economic ties. And uh, I didn't know, you know, other than you, who I should, you know, recommend that he talk to. And I said, well, you thought right. You should definitely talk to me. I'm not letting him leave the UAE because I'm going to hire him, <laughs> okay, <laughs> so that we can build this together. And then a couple of weeks later, after several Zooms, this was during, you know, time we couldn't really see each other, we made the deal. And for the last two years, we've had this phenomenal partnership which is you know, very important. Everybody now gets this. Now, in the beginning, there was all kinds of excitement in the press, and we're going to do great things, and people started going on these sort of venture capital tours to the Gulf, and Israelis were descending and excited. And then I was actually interviewed uh, a couple weeks after the Accords were signed on CNBC. Now, normally, in these kinds of interviews, they're very, very easy on you. It's nice. They're not trying to catch you, but this pesky journalist asked me a tough question. She said, okay, so all this is excitement, great, make it work on dollars and cents for me. How much money is this going to represent over the next period of time? And I thought, and I wasn't prepped, right? I didn't have the briefing, I hadn't really thought about it. So, but I took a, a leap and I said, you know, I think it's going to generate something like $10 billion of activity. And the interview ended. Next thing you know is my phone starts to ring like crazy, mostly from people in my organization who yelled at me on the phone saying, why did you have to say 10 billion? One billion wouldn't be enough. You have to exaggerate. Okay, you really think that's gonna be 10 billion? And I said, you know, yeah, I, I really do. Then I get another call. Sabah gets on the phone with me and says, why were you so conservative? And I said, what do you mean conservative? I said, 10 billion. People are yelling. He goes, no, you know it's going to be 100 billion. Well, on the one year anniversary, the minister of economy of the UAE settled this debate. And he said, it's going to be $1 trillion of activity. So my 10 million does not look so small anymore. And if you, and if you look at what's going on, the fact that we've signed a free trade agreement, the fastest free trade agreement in history. Free trade agreements are not signed between countries lightly. They are signed between friends. They take forever to negotiate. The diplomat is, is, is shaking his head. Ask him how hard it is to do free trade agreements. It's not easy. This one was done in a matter of months. I don't know what they fed these diplomats. Okay, but they did something right and it's working. Now, if you look at what we're doing in the Gulf, we have actually signed up with ADGM, which is Abu Dhabi Global Markets. We're the first Israeli financial group to be fully registered, established there. And stay tuned because we're looking at this differently. We're investing, not just bringing Abu Dhabi or Dubai or other Bahraini money into Israel, but we're investing over there. And we're going to be announcing major investments. We've already made an investment. I'll share with you a slide. Here's uh, Dr. Sabah, who's been on all kinds of um, TV and, and whatnot talking about our efforts. Uh, but we're looking at this from a long-term perspective. And this is someone, if you don't know him, he's, a, you know, I think quite a hero, which is uh, Mohammed Alabar, who's the builder of the Burj and one of the great entrepreneurs in Dubai. And when he was asked by a group of Israeli entrepreneurs, what's the advice? How can we really realize this potential? He said something which for a second sort of stunned them because they didn't really understand what he was saying. He said, we don't do business. I need to meet your mother and you need to come and meet my mother. Really? The answer is yes, really. 
because we're talking about not transactional activity. We're talking about relationships. We're talking about building trust that is multifaceted, that is not just a business deal, but it's cultural, like that beautiful, you know, uh, musical interlude, thank you, okay, of a Iraqi piyut. What an appropriate thing to be playing in the time leading up to, you know, Rosh Hashanah, our new year, happy new year to everybody, and uh, our day of atonement. It's about getting together culturally, realizing what we have in common, which Sabah and I have been doing, you know, on weekends together with our wives and our families. And it's about that. That's what has to happen. That's why this event is so critical because you're bringing people together, not just to listen to people, you know, like me or even better yet, professors from Stanford, okay, but to get to know each other. And that's really, really critical. We also have to realize that nobody is functioning here like a giant ATM machine, okay? There were a lot of Israeli entrepreneurs who I think had this vision in their head that in particular, you know, the UAE was going to, you know, if you could just get the code right, spew money, you know, out of the sky, okay, on this uh, already very successful entrepreneurial scene. And that is completely wrong, okay? That is the wrong attitude. That's going to get you nowhere, okay, in terms of building this long-term relationship. Now, when you look at, you know, and these were slides I did for a UAE only, and we could certainly include them with, with the Bahrain and, and Morocco, please forgive me. But you look at what has happened, both in our country and your countries. The growth has been remarkable. This picture of Tel Aviv was about 100 years ago, a little bit more. Okay, the picture of Dubai and, and where, where it has grown from nothing, okay, is extraordinary. And I think that here in Israel, we need to realize that the entrepreneurial relationship is at eye level. We say, begove naim. Okay, the, these societies are as deeply entrepreneurial as we are. Maybe in Dubai it's expressed mostly in logistics or transportation or smart cities or trade or building everything, okay? Whereas here we're about tech. But it's true if you look at what Bahrain has managed to do with its society, how Morocco has moved into a leadership position in Africa and is the, literally the gateway to Africa. We need to understand that both, both sides of this equation are entrepreneurial at a deep level. Now, we're investing, as I mentioned, already over in the UAE, and we hope to make investments in Morocco and in Bahrain. We've invested, our first investment is in a spectacular fund called Global Ventures, run by this brilliant woman, Noor Saweed. And what Noor set out to do is to say, you know what? We're going to change the model of just doing iterative ventures where we take ideas that came from the West and we implement them now in the Middle East. So a classic example of that is Kareem, which is a wonderful company, good for them, good for Uber. If you guys don't know what Kareem is, it's the Uber of the Middle East was bought by Uber for two billion. What was the number for Kareem? Only 600 million. It was, it was a good exit for the venture investors. And there are lots of companies like that. You need a delivery service, we'll build a delivery service. You need an e-commerce site, okay, which is selling things, we'll do that. That's not the future of the Middle East technology scene. It's going to be Middle Eastern companies, and I mean both in the Emirates and Morocco and Bahrain, who are trying to solve global issues as are Israeli companies. Right? Someone once said, a very smart guy named Muli Eden from Intel, said the way that you get an Israeli team to get off their butt and start really working, you know how you do that? Tell them what they're trying to do is impossible. Okay, and then they start to move. And this is what we are gonna do together. The world is now going to get used to watching us lead together. 
It was really interesting. During the pandemic, I don't know how many of you used to look at those charts about who was getting vaccinated. And there was a time there when there were three countries leading all of the charts all of the world in terms of their vaccination. And it so happened to be those three countries were Israel, the UAE, and Bahrain. Everybody else was eating our dust. And I was saying, wait, is it, have the, the Accords already worked their magic so quickly? But what it was reflective of is just the entrepreneurial shared energy that these countries were going to get out ahead of this and make sure that their populations were vaccinated. And it had a huge impact in terms of the health. And, and, and that's going to become the pattern and the model going forward. So we have a bunch of companies who are doing work already there. This is an example of a, of a company called Theta Ray, which is doing uh, essentially financial security for big banks, just signed a major deal with Mashrek Bank in the UAE and others. You'll be hearing more about this company. And our vision is, and again, it's not just scale up in the UAE, it's in the UAE, Bahrain, and Morocco. I don't think we're scaling up in Sudan yet, okay? We have to wait a little while for that to happen. But uh, the reality is that we are blessed here with tons of startups. But in order for them to scale up and get to global markets, they've got to work together with our partners. And it turns out that people around the world understand that when reconciliation happens, when a normalization or peace, and, and this is not about peace accords because peace were only between countries that actually fought. And in these cases, these countries never fought. Okay, but the reality is that when normalization happens, boom happens. So if you look what happened in Japan and in Germany after World War II, economic boom. And it turns out that Japanese and German investors, more than anyone else in my opinion, are interested in investing in this reconciliation because they get it and they want to be part of the growth that's gonna happen. And the world is interested, will invest. And finally, I'm gonna leave it with this and then we're gonna take some, some questions. What I think is that our leadership is not gonna just be in making money and an economic freedom, which is very important, and development of our countries. But we are going to attack world issues. We are committed deeply to 17 SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, okay? And next week we'll be announcing, it's not public yet, an initiative at our crowd to support these goals and to raise money. Because the issues of climate change, of air quality and water quality, of food security, of health care, are simply too big. We've got to find solutions now. It's up to this generation. My generation has had a go at it. We haven't done very, very well. The problems are still growing. They are not being solved properly. And we have to do this with startups. That's where we're gonna find these solutions and we're waiting for you. And we're gonna do what we can to fund you, to support you, and in particular to celebrate this incredible release in energy. It's hard to be competing against a party. I, I, maybe we should just go over there and dance uh, if it's a wedding or something. But the reality is that, uh, again, I wanna thank you, Bob and, and Dove for putting this together. And I'm happy to take a couple of questions and you know, really mabruk to everybody here for this incredible moment of history. Thank you. In the 90s, we had a lot of optimism about uh, free trade bringing along peace and mutual understanding, end of history, all that. Um, but today we're presented with a big counterexample um, with, uh, with China. And I wanted to know how you think the Abraham Accords are different. Because it's not about just free trade. It's about entrepreneurial joint action. Free trade is an important thing. I don't want to belittle it. I think I'm, I'm a free trader, okay? Uh, and I think that, you know, if there was really free trade with China, it never was really done properly, okay? You know, talk to American companies that tried to make businesses work in China and ask them how free was the free trade part of this, 
okay? Uh, and I think that it never really got to the right level. But here it's not just about trade. It's about building companies together. And what we do in this country is we start companies. Okay, nobody in the world starts companies like Israel. How in the heck did we get 100 unicorns in this country of 10 million people? Because we're really good at starting them. But long term, we've got to create companies of hundreds of billions of dollars that are solving issues. I'll give you an example. You look at one of, one of the plagues that's affecting the world today, which we don't talk about enough, is toxic algal blooms. How many, I just want to see hands, how many know what a toxic algal bloom is? This is scary that only two or three of you or five of you know. Um, it turns out algae, you've seen algae, scum, it looks like green stuff. It turns out atzot in Hebrew. Uh, it turns out that many of these algae can go toxic and can take all of the oxygen out of the water, kill the, the water you know, creatures and the other plants and make it so it's unsafe to drink the water. Over one million lakes in the world are affected by this plague. So how are we going to solve it? And what's happening, by the way, is we don't have enough water in the world that what water we have is now being polluted by algae. So there is a company that we've created called Blue Green Water Technologies who is instantly, literally in a day, curing a lake. They figured out a way to nano-encapsulate a safe uh, treatment, which you can literally then circulate through the lake. It floats on top. And it's being deployed in South Africa, all over the United States, in Lake Okeechobee, in uh, Florida, in, in South Carolina. This needs to scale up. It's going to be a business of billions of dollars someday. Who knows how to scale companies and get them around the world, especially in markets which we can't really yet access, like Pakistan or Indonesia or other countries in, in uh, Southeast Asia. And so the beauty here is to take these kinds of solution companies and scale them up, not just to a billion dollars, but to tens of billions of dollars to solve these issues. And there are so many areas. I'll give you one other example, which I'm very committed to, is food. Take a look at me. I, I like food. Uh, we all do. Except that the, the rest of the world doesn't have that much food. There's plenty of countries where food security is a major issue and the shortage of wheat and whatnot. People are, are hungry today in Africa. I imagine Morocco is being hit okay, by food security issues and other parts of the Middle East. Certainly the Sudan is. Okay, wow, these guys are really playing loud. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, it's cool. I'll speak louder. Uh, but in any event, it turns out that today we are figuring out new ways to grow food, not just to make agriculture more efficient, but the protein that we eat, whether it's milk protein or meat protein or fish protein or egg protein, is going to be grown in factories. Okay, literally this is happening, and I guarantee you that in five and ten years from now, we'll all be eating this stuff as though it's completely natural. And the stuff is going to be grown cheaper in price than real agriculturally produced food. And guess what? It's going to help save the planet because of the greenhouse gas. You know what's the biggest emitter of greenhouse gases in the world? It's agriculture. It's those farting and burping sheep and cows, okay? And it's even the people who are growing agriculture in the ground because they stir up the carbon. Okay, it's killing us. The way that agriculture is done, we have no choice but to figure out how to mitigate it, how to reduce it, how to, you know, today I was talking to a company in our portfolio called Be Free Agro, who are using drones to help uh, grazing, okay, where they're literally controlling cows and sheep at pasture. Okay, with drones, and it turns out by doing it intelligently, you can reduce the amount of greenhouse gas because they leave the roots in the ground and that holds the carbon in. 
This is huge, monstrous stuff. Now, it turns out that we have a company called Remilk, who are literally, you can go to their offices in Rehovot, comes out of the Weizmann Institute. And what they're doing is they're growing milk protein in, in vats through biotechnology. And they're going to be producing it at about half the price of real, real milk. This is called Remilk. But no lactose and no cholesterol. Really cool for those of us who worry about those things. And it turns out that they came to the Israeli government and they said, we want to build a factory. We're going to invest $100 million. They raised, we were early investors. They've raised now about $120 million. We want to build a factory to produce this new remilk. And the Israelis said, great, good idea. It will take us about four years to permit and license you to start building this factory. And immediately they left the meeting and said, not in Israel, we're not building this factory. And within like two months, they had a deal in Denmark, that you know, iconic country of, of dairy, to build this $100 million project. Now imagine Bahrain, okay, that decides now and has the capital to start building a food industry based on this next generation of technology where all of a sudden you're growing in factories. You're growing meat protein, fish protein. We have another company called Mermaid who are growing scallops, okay, from uh, vats. It means I'm gonna be able to eat it because it's gonna be kosher, okay? It's very important. Uh, <laughs> and there we have vertical farms, we're invested in the world's leading vertical farm company called Plenty, who Walmart is now adopting, Bahrain can not only feed itself, but it can export to the entire Gulf. It's simply a decision of deploying capital, getting access to the right companies. And my prediction is as soon as this sort of, we, we used to say when the Asimon Nafala, when the little token falls down, we used to use these tokens for telephone machines, when, when people get it, I think that what's going to happen is because of the sort of slowness to respond uh, at the governmental level in countries like Israel or the West, that you could have a situation where the Gulf becomes a worldwide producer of food to feed the world, because it's simply going to grow indoors where you can build wonderful buildings and the technology, much of it, will start out from Israel, okay? And this is going to happen, okay? You watch five years, 10 years from now, we're all going to see this happen. But we need to get behind it. We need to do this kind of work. And the, the, the beauty of taking young people who really want to do something with their careers and their lives, but they want to attack these issues. We all want to be part of this solution. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be around to see it all, okay? Because it's going to take us decades to really solve these problems. You are. You are going to see this happen in your lifetimes. And hopefully many of you in this room are going to be leaders of this. Can I get another question or two? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Alon. I work as a machine learning uh, researcher, and I'm also doing a master thesis on this specific slide. This specific <laughs> slide is my master thesis. Uh, we're Contact me alone. We're, yeah, we're dealing with um, identifying um, SDGs, uh, startups for SDGs on a mass scale, not like you probably, I'm assuming you have a team, and then you take a, a single company, and you, you know, work around that company like for months and stuff like that. So no, we, we have 365 companies and we have 250 people, Perfect. and we have 220,000 investors signed up on our platform. So my, so my question regarding to my uh, Adam Karovitz, let's more, a person that's close to his own. So regarding uh, this specific thing in, in uh, identifying companies, just like the companies you mentioned, my question is, did you, have you given any thought or do you have any lead about identifying these kind of companies on scale, which means that if I'm thinking about uh, an internet database of uh, startups that I won't mention the name of, if, are you able to, did you e even put any thought into, let's try and take out only the SDGs number seven out of these 10,000, list of 10,000 you know, well, Our, our, our database at the moment is about 15,000 startups 
uh, globally. We, we invested our crowd in Israel. About 50 to 60% of our companies are here. Already 40% to 50% are outside of Israel. So we're global investors. We are trying to reach scale, and it's not easy. Okay, uh, we, at the moment, according to PitchBook, which is pretty authoritative, we're by far the most active venture investor in Israel. We do 150 rounds a year. And our model is democratic, so that individuals can invest in the companies they'd like or in funds. We have 365 companies, we have 40 different funds, including a new fund coming out on the 17 SDGs next week. So, you know, the problem is, is that the scale that we're talking about, we manage $2 billion of assets, we hope to get to 10 billion in the next two or three years, it's still a drop in the bucket. Right? There are about $90 trillion in individual hands okay, uh, among high net worth individuals. So the moment I get to a trillion dollars of assets going here, then we can start to make some, some real headway. Okay? And if you have ideas, I mean, we're, we have a whole machine learning artificial intelligence group. We're actually building it in Abu Dhabi, would you believe? And we're going to get ready in the next couple of weeks to announce that initiative together with the government there. We are very committed to using, you know, the most modern technology for us to find these operations. But we're investing, you know, I could spend all night telling you about some of the companies. Uh, if you keep on going, I might. Uh, you know, that we're dealing with. But, like, we just approved, I was sharing with Dove, an amazing Canadian company that's called Flash Forest, okay? And listen to this. The world is now suffering from a plague of wildfires, right, where we've lost a trillion trees in the world. Literally, there were, they estimated there used to be two trillion trees. Half of the tree cover is gone. We've lost, the world has lost half of its trees, and we're losing more all the time. So it turns out that this company in Canada is focusing on how to replant a forest in a flash. You know, the fire comes and burns it in a flash, we should figure out how to replant it. Unfortunately, the two models people use today are send in people with shovels and plant little seedlings, which we know from our country is one of the, Israel is one of the two countries in the world that's increased over the last hundred years its tree cover. Okay, the other is the US, believe it or not. Um, that doesn't work anymore. Okay, you can't go into these areas that burn. So what people have been trying to do is to airdrop seeds and, and make it work. That doesn't work either. So what it does is it just attracts rodents and squirrels who get sick from eating so many you know, seeds that are being dropped. And so what this company has done is they've created a special pod. They've been working for years to research it. And inside that pod, they put a seedling and they put fertilizer and they put actually rodent preventer, you know, uh, repellent. And then they shoot them from drones at high speed, okay? And they shoot with such force that these pods actually get embedded in the ground and that 40% of these pods grow a tree. And so you send in the drones and boom, you have a completely reform. That's a solution the world needs. This single company is going to plant a billion trees over the next six years. That's scale. Not enough, by the way, because we're missing a trillion. Okay, but when you know how much carbon each tree contributes, this is solution. So whether it's toxic algal bloom or food technology or it's how to reduce you know, uh, energy uh, waste, so for example, it turns out in this country we have a system called the Iron Dome, right, which protects us from missile attack. The same company which does the software that powers the Iron Dome is now powering advanced grid software, how to make an electrical grid. And they estimate, by the way, that we can make the electricity system just by software have 20% more efficiency. So it means for the same amount of energy that we generate, we can get 20% more electricity into the home. Do you know how huge that is? Right now, this whole crisis in Europe 
is about that 15 to 20 percent. And if they had the right software, problem solved, at least for now. So there are so many technology solutions. Talk about healthcare, okay? During the pandemic, one of the things which just burned me up was watching the advanced world led by our countries, getting their people vaccinated while the poor countries sat and watched, could not get vaccinated. Why? Because they don't have the cold chain. They can't freeze the stuff. They can't, you couldn't deliver the Moderna or the Pfizer vaccine into parts of Africa or Latin America or even rural America. It was difficult. And it turns out that why don't we have oral vaccines? Why don't we have a simple pill that you can swallow and you can get all over the world so everybody can have access to a vaccine? And that's under development now. And so there are changes and solutions that affect all of these SDGs that we can scale. It's simply a question of will, money, governmental support, and you guys getting involved as the leaders and the people who are going to essentially make this happen. That's what's critical. I'm going to let you guys go to this party, okay, and continue on. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Thank you very much.